uh, Eskimo Live is going to talk to you about live and how important it is to the music industry and how important it could be to you. So exactly what the panel is discussing there, the ways beyond the TV ad, how you can engage with music and get great value out of it. So I'm Paul, I'm Managing Director of Eskimo Live. We are a brand and music partnerships agency. That means that we create um, digital and physical experiential activations for brands. We consult them as to the best way to spend their money depending on their objectives. Um, we're going to concentrate today on live performance. Um, this slide basically uh, indicates the evolution of the music industry in terms of its remuneration which we're experiencing as we speak. Um, we've already heard from some of the people today about the need for brands in the future, uh, the development of that evolution. Um, and I'm going to concentrate today specifically on the live performance aspect of that. Um, although that is one of my favorite slides just because it took me so long to pose for it. <laughs> um, so what are the live events that you can get involved in? Well, just to run through them quickly, obviously we have artist tours at the very top of the industry. Some of the biggest names in the world are still looking for brand partnerships. We've seen Bieber and Xbox Connect uh, get together for, the, for his tour. We've seen Blackberry and Black Eyed Peas do something really uh, interesting and experiential on their tour. We've got an ever-growing festival scene. Big players are Live Nation, AEG, but there's an increasing number of uh, independence popping up. And then we go to the grassroots section of the industry, which will rely on brands like yourselves and the brands that you represent, helping break those acts and giving them the audience that they need to go forward. So there's plenty of scope for brands to get involved um, across the music industry. The music industry wants you to be involved, um, but there's also plenty of pitfalls. So whatever you do in your activation, please be sure that you don't waste your money. Um, almost everyone on that screen has, uh, and it hasn't worked out very well for any of them. Um, it won't work out very well for you either. So how do we ensure that we get a return on our investment? Um, it's something that your agency and that we at Eskimo uh, try to ensure when we're creating a strategy for a brand, and we believe there are three keys to that, some of which we have already mentioned today. Um, the first of those would be create an experience. So whether it's, whether it's physical or virtual, your campaign must be offering the consumer an experience that they're grateful to you for. Traditional badging and sponsorship doesn't get anyone anywhere. Just as a show of hands, who in this room is aware of Wireless Festival? Does, can someone tell me, do you know who sponsors Wireless Festival? No. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right, the overwhelming response there was O2. The correct answer is Barclay Card. O2 haven't sponsored Wireless Festival in two years. If you go to Wireless Festival, you'll be surrounded by 5,000 wireless with Barclay Card flags. The main stage will be covered in Barclay Card badging. And I've done this, because like, we work at Wireless Festival for various brands. And you'll say to the consumer there, so do you come to Wireless every year? They go, oh, I never miss O2. <laughs> Barclay Card must be, my heart bleeds for them. They spend four or five million pounds and people are still calling it O2 Festival. They're not creating enough experience. The only experience there is in the VIP area to about 1,000 of the 50,000 people that are there. Next, engagement. The panel touched on it briefly, but you've got to be engaging with your audience. Uh, there's going to be, whatever you do, whatever your campaign is, it will ultimately probably end with an event or a finale or some description. Um, that means that you've got to run up to that event, time for you to engage your consumer. You need to engage them before the event, during the event and after the event where possible. Um, whether that's online competitions or something physical and experiential is up to you. Lastly, access. So you need to be offering your consumer access to either events, whether it's priority tickets or even um, preferential hospitality at those events, uh, or even it could be content otherwise not available to them. So, there's plenty of scope there for you to do that, and when you're interacting with a live event, they normally record their content, and record content before the event itself, have access to the artist, and so on. So there's plenty of scope for you to do that. Thank you. Um, so, experience, engagement, and access. Sometimes your experience will be your access, sometimes your access will be your experience. 
if you can just make sure throughout the development of your strategy that you're touching on at least two of those, hopefully all three, then you've gone a very long way to ensuring that your brand's going to get a return on this activation and you're not throwing your money down the drain. So a quick case study I'm going to run through. don't want to incur the wrath of uh, Messrs. Yershin and Austin. Um, but, so we created an experiential activation for Ugg Australia, uh, Ugg Boots, as you may know them, um, and Remington, who were clients that we brought together to create a zone called Beauty and Beats, which was an experiential zone that toured four festivals in the UK um, in 2009-2010. So the idea of the zone was that um, we collaborate those two brands with Office, Superdrug, Nicole Farhi, and TG, um, and we create a zone where beauty meets music. Um, it was essentially a VIP experience, but accessible by all 50,000 people at the, fest at the festival. So you could come and you could enjoy our catwalk shows, our bars, our drinks, our DJs. You could watch cat the catwalk shows, you could get your hair done for free by Remington, you could get a head-to-toe makeover by Superdrug, and you could shop in the Ugg retail shop at 50% off. We had bean bags, deck chairs, hammocks. People were coming and spending two to three hours at a time in our zone. Um, so, <coughs> just some more images there of exactly what I just said to you. We also, with our experience um, working with people like Live Nation and AEG, we know what rights you can and should be getting. Um, and I've also seen people not use agencies like ours and not get those rights, having spent five, six times what our brand has <coughs> spent. So an example of that is that we negotiated and insisted upon um, Ugg Australia having retail rights uh, in year two. What that meant was they recouped 50% of their spend whilst on site activating during the festival. So we agreed a fee up front for their gate, their gate fee and their um, rights access, and they recruited 50% of that while activating at the festival. Um, I'll go through, quickly through this. We've got examples of Ugg being featured in uh, DJ Mag, Music Mag, Mix Mag, which they have no right to be in. Um, Remington Online, broadcast <coughs> coverage on ITN, BBC, MTV, and the national tabloids. Um, and all in all, Ugg and Remington uh, calculated their return on investment across both years of 37 to 1. So that's advertising, press coverage, consumer interaction, retail revenues, and broadcast coverage. So, our experience with the chill-out zone, the bars, the DJs, the shop, the hair, the makeup, and the catwalks. Our engagement with the online competitions leading up to each event, data capture, ongoing communications, and of course, the festival advertising. <coughs> Live Nation spend about a million pounds uh, advertising each festival, and that campaign runs for four months. If you're smart and you get your activations planned by the end of the previous year, you can take part of the, the expense of your activation out of your advertising budget because you can calculate what value you're going to get on behalf of Live Nation spend. And access, obviously we offered access through Ugg and Remington, uh, which drove the engagement to give people access to the festival in, by way of tickets and also access to the zone once they were there. Here's how they calculated their ROI. Um, value just for year two at 4.5 million pounds. Here's what not to do. So, generic car company, I won't go into them, but whilst we had this uh, activation of Beauty and Beats at Hard Rock Calling, one of the four festivals, across the way from us was a car company who someone at the top of the corporation had said, this car deserves a younger audience, stick them at one of those festival things, right? That's what all the kids are doing. They went straight to the festival owner without consulting or getting any audit of the scene. They said, we, well, we know we're late, but the festival's only a month away and we haven't got much money. Will, will a couple of million get us anything? <laughs> they had no engagement, they had no experience, they had no access, they didn't have the time to do any of this. All they had was a car on a podium and people handing out leaflets saying, go to this website and you can win this car. People were sitting in our area drinking our drinks, listening to our DJs, watching our catwalk shows, going, what the f*** is going on over there? <laughs> Why is that car just sitting in the middle of the festival? <laughs> uh, needless to say, I doubt they'll be doing a similar activation anytime soon. Vodafone actually do really good uh, music uh, activations <coughs> and strategies, but still within that there's a couple of glaring missed opportunities. They provide these charging stations for mobile phones. Great idea. It shows you've understood the festival goers' experience, and that's, that's invaluable. However, there's no point having them at day festivals where there's no camping. I arrive at 2, I leave at 10.30, my phone should last that amount. You can't get service anyway, it's not like you can use your phone. Uh, all that happens is that they remain empty all day. 
and you've got seven Glum Vodafone employees looking bored out of their minds and turning away Orange and O2 customers who actually might need the service. Um, they also have this priority seating area, front of house at the festival. Uh, but I've got Vodafone customers asking me, what is that? Can I sit there? Well, why are you asking me? Why aren't Vodafone telling you? The technology exists to, to geofence the perimeter of a festival now so that when you walk in, you can actually receive a text direct from the phone provider. They should be telling you there is space available at the O2 festival. Uh, sorry, at the uh, priority seating area. Come and register and join us. So, I'm going to remember to show they understood the festival goers experience. So did Vodafone. So did Orange. This is an example of the smart tent um, at a festival where you're camping. You can now get this smart tent. Save its number because it has an SMS receiver in it. And when you're going back to your campsite at 2 in the morning and it's pitch black, everyone is stumbling over their tent. You can actually text your tent and it will flash and say, here I am, I'm over here. Right? That's a really clever example of Orange saying, well, we could spend four million pounds putting our name over the, over the event just for someone to call it O2. Or we can work out what the festival goers experience is and try and make it even better. And lastly, get some nuts. If you really want to control the experience and create the experience, control all of the engagement and own all of the access, create your own event. Right? There's plenty of people out there that can help you do it, and the money that's being spent to sponsor other people's event can be spent just as well to create your own. That makes it a money can't buy ticket, and that is invaluable. That will create your engagement, it also creates your experience, and really it helps you hit all three of the keys that we spoke about, experience, engagement, and access. Um, I'm Paul Sampson, thanks for listening.